So today my talk is going to be focused on the New South, and this is not a, a subject that you're often going to hear. In fact, uh, most of the time we focus on the Old South. But I want to mention something that General Livingston said last night that's um, pretty important. He actually brought this up. He said, look, if you're looking for something to study, and we have a lot of younger students here, look at Southern military history in the postbellum period. Don't just focus on that four-year period of Southern history. And we do that too often. The South is not 1861 to 1865. The South is 1607 to the present. And so when you start studying Southern history, look at some of the subjects that for us would be you know, untreaded territory. And that would be Southern military history in the postbellum period or maybe even in the revolutionary period. Uh, so he, he brought both those up, and I think that was great. And In fact, my talk's going to focus on not only military history, but other aspects of the New South that I think would be a great area for scholars to explore moving forward. So as scholars dedicated to exploring what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition, we are most often drawn to the antebellum South in the early federal period, the days when Jeffersonian federalism and political economy reigned supreme and Southern statesmen were regarded as the best in the land. We still fight the old battles, taking our time to explain the morality of secession and nullification, the depth of antebellum Southern literary and religious figures, the Jeffersonian critique of industrial capitalism, and the unquestioned superiority of Southern legal scholars and political theorists like St. George Tucker, Abel Upshur, John Taylor of Caroline, and John C. Calhoun. Antebellum Southerners, as Eugene Genvesi pointed out, have an important place in the historical record, not merely as subjects of condemnation, as the modern profession so often proclaims, but as real intellectuals whose, quote, finest aspects of their thought, shorn from the tragic commitment to slavery and racism, constitute a searing critique of some of the most dangerous tendencies in modern life. We wield pens instead of rifles and charge the ramparts for historical glory, waving our flags and hoping that we will not meet the same fate as Pettigrew's men at Gettysburg. Unfortunately, the cultural Marxists stand on Cemetery Ridge, supported by the huge cannons of the Lincolnian myth, the professional academy, and their allies that control American pop culture and media. And I think this is instructive for Southern historians, particularly those who refuse to subscribe to the presentist narrative that saturates the Establishment Academy. I am not suggesting that we concede the field, surrender, and retreat to our homes, but we should not die in vainglory either. The old battles are still worthwhile, and we can find avenues to parry their attacks, perhaps even mount an oblique assault. I think an institute of northern studies, dedicated to northern hypocrisy on a variety of antebellum issues, things like slavery, secession, racism, history, literature, that would be splendid, wouldn't it? The problem is who'd want to go and work for that, right? So, this, uh, this has been and continues to be our goal, to chip away at the treasury of counterfeit virtue of northern self-righteousness. This is often enjoyable. Indeed, it can be quite exhilarating. But by focusing most of our energy on the antebellum period, we leave other parts of southern history open to the ravages of the modern academy, a group which views every subject through the lens of race, class, and gender. The postbellum period in southern history has suffered the most for this. The historian George Tyndall, often considered one of the deans of the New South field, wrote that, quote, part of the trouble with the years after Reconstruction has been the apparent lack of dramatic appeal. This is true. Modern Southern historians looking for a topic are naturally drawn to the conflict of the antebellum period. More often, they look at the antebellum era and the war as an opportunity to either gut or support the lost, quote unquote, lost cause narrative. For example, current Harvard University President Drew Gilpin Faust crafted an image of rowdy, riotous women in the South during the war to combat the myth that women enthusiastically supported the Southern cause. In fact, uh, where I live in, in Columbus, Georgia, they put a, a historical marker up about this now. There's the women's riot that, uh, to, to combat this lost cause myth. Of course, this belies the historical record. But Faust made a career out of her attempts to destroy the so-called lost cause myth, and she is not alone. An entire library could be filled with books dedicated to the eradication of the lost cause. The modern political and cultural anti-Southern pogroms are merely an extension of this trend. At the heart of this historical debate is not the Confederacy itself, but the memory of the antebellum South, or in other words, the collective remembered past of the Southern people. Faust, like other anti-lost causers, is both 
the, in both the historical profession and the mainstream educational, political, and cultural establishment is not really concerned with Southern history per se, but with how Southerners and Americans at large interpret and remember their history. Their goal is political, not intellectual. Charles Dew, whose Apostles of Disunion is now required reading for graduate students across the United States, openly admitted as such when he wrote in the preface of his work that it was intended to be a polemic against the neo-Confederate movement. That's a political, not a historical statement. This is why Richard Weaver chose to write about the postbellum South in his seminal The Southern Tradition at Bay, subtitled A History of Postbellum Thought. Weaver understood that this is where the real battle was taking place, as Southerners came out of the war with the intent of defining the South and defending their cause. Making the term lost cause a pejorative tied to race and slavery has not only altered our perception of the antebellum South, but has critically wounded the study of the New South as well. It was the New South, after all, which supposedly made the whole thing up. They lied. At least that's what they tell you. These, then, are the great, great questions of our age. Who were the New South leaders, and what did they want? Was their conception of the Old South rooted in wishful myth-making or honest history? How did they ultimately affect American politics and culture? Was the Solid South based entirely on the principles of white supremacy? And most important, can the study of the New South provide examples of the Southern tradition? Meaning, was there a continuity between the Old and the New South? The question of continuity can be addressed in several ways, but the two most pressing issues are cultural and economic, with culture comprising the political culture as well as the general habits, attitudes, and ideas of the Southern people. The New South is often regarded as a trajectory or transitionary phase for the Southern economy. When Henry Grady visited New York in 1886 and gave his famous New South speech, he championed, quote, new ideas and aspirations in the South. These included most conspicuously railroads and factories in place of cotton fields and cash crops. The, that image of an industrializing South stuck. The South, it was argued, would only be rescued from the crushing poverty brought on by the war through economic diversification. We often attach this New South moniker to economic transformation. And certainly there were Southerners even before the war who pushed this message. James DeBow, for example, in his famous DeBow's Review, argued that the South needed to diversify its economy to keep pace with the North. And a few industrial centers did take root in the South, most importantly Columbus, Georgia, Augusta, Georgia, and Richmond, Virginia. But most Southerners did not see the necessity in investing money in factories or railroads when they could become very wealthy growing cotton, sugar, or rice. And the good navigable rivers of the South seemed to make railroads an expensive and wasteful economic adventure. The same held true for factories. Large plantations were a certain avenue for wealth. Factories were not. So historians have debated the wealth of the Old South, but studies in the 1970s conclusively proved that the South was not poor before the war, and wealth was distributed across a wide swath of society, not concentrated in a few quote-unquote oligarchs who ruled the region. There were more middling landowners and a more vibrant middle class than the traditional image of the South, uh, South portrayed. What transpired after the war, of course, was crushing poverty for the entire region. And it seemed that the South had to adopt new economic models to dig itself out of the Yankee-imposed economic mess. What might be surprising to most, however, was that the South remained predominantly agricultural well into the mid-20th century. Most Southerners, black and white, were still farmers. Only 15% of Southerners were engaged in manufacturing in 1910. And by 1930, 70% of the South was still rural, compared to 44% for the rest of the United States. Cotton production doubled in the 1870s, between the 1870s and 1890s, as its production for other cash crops, including tobacco. Farms did begin to diversify, and by the, the 20th century, the South was a leading exporter of fruits and vegetables, and both wheat and cattle production increased exponentially. Now, there were warning signs that this would change, hence the manifesto, I'll take my stand. The Southerners who penned this marvelous collection of essays were concerned that the way of life they had all known and accepted as the bedrock of stable civilization, land and agriculture, and of course Christianity, was slowly, be, slowly being chipped away by mechanization. 
Ninety years later, their prognostications have been proven correct. Today, Southerners are more concerned with Wall Street stocks than the cotton price. But today, my talk is not necessarily concerned with the broad transformation of the Southern economy, nor with the microeconomics of the region, but how Southerners coped with the transformations within the context of being Southern. And of course, that's the focus of our summer school. We have to remember that the agrarians were Southern first and foremost. Their worldview was pegged to a way of life entirely unique in the American experience. They came from a region steeped in history and culture, which is why they reacted so harshly to H.L. Mencken's characterization of the region as the Sahara of the Beaux-Arts. Mencken, of course, was not entirely disparaging the South in this famous essay, or infamous essay. His was a lament of what once was. As he wrote, antebellum Southern civilization was, quote, the best that these states have ever seen. But Mencken missed the vital link between the old and the new, the continuity that held the past and the present. The South may have been changing, but it was a uniquely Southern change. And the agrarians pointed that out in scathing commentary. Mencken did not understand nor recognize the jewels of the South produced after the war. She was still a vibrant section which is why modern students of the South, particularly those interested in saving Southern civilization, should pay more attention to the New South. Southerners were still consciously Southern in the postbellum period. This may seem like an obvious statement, but we have to remember that their identity was constantly being attacked and disparaged by Northern forces. What we're going through is not new. Reconciliation had not yet arrived in the 1860s and 1870s, and even into the early 1900s, the South was still, off, still the conspicuous other in American society, the section of traitors and the economic and social drag on, the, on American progress. Southerners sought to salvage their identity from the ruins of war. More important, Southerners wanted to show the American people that their region was vital to the American experience. And Southerners aimed to place their own stamp on this idea of progress. Genovese called this the slaveholder's dilemma in the antebellum period, the coupling of the belief in progress with a labor system that was characterized as medieval. In the postbellum period, Southerners aspired to show their northern counterparts that their civilization was as progressive as the North. Simply put, they clamored for acceptance within the context of their own unique identity. It was not cultural assimilation they desired, but real diversity. This has been disparagingly called the New South Creed, a myth that helped spawn the Lost Cause myth. Those who tear down the New South Creed do, to, do so in the same way they attack the Lost Cause. The Creed was a myth perpetrated by Southern advocates who lied about the real conditions of the South in order to attract foreign capital, meaning Northern investment. This ultimately involved the establishment of Jim Crow segregation, a system C. Van Woodward pointed out was created in Northern cities and then copied in the South with much resistance from the Redeemer class. So how much of this was true? Was the South a cultural wasteland after the war? And how did Southerners southernize industrialization? And how did the South view its past? So both talks today are going to focus on that broad theme. There are so many questions to be answered in the New South period, yet so few or too few of us spend any time investigating and studying that era of Southern history. <clears throat> in the decades following the war, nearly 700 former Confederates or Confederate leaders served in elected positions at every level of government. One, LQC Lamar, served on the Supreme Court. In some cases, these leaders became Republicans and helped form early Reconstruction efforts, most notably Amos Ackerman, who held the position of Attorney General in the Grant Administration. Ackerman was later sacked because he opposed federal aid to struggling northern railroads. By the 1870s, there were enough former Confederate leaders in Congress that one California newspaper thought it necessary to print the names of every quote-unquote rebel who represented the Democratic Party in Washington, D.C. These men were often called the Rebel Brigadiers, and they would infuriate their northern counterparts with continual references to the glory of the Old South. Now, one of these men was John Warwick Daniel of Virginia. In fact, was of Lynchburg of Virginia, who was called the Lame Lion of Lynchburg. 
and he epitomized these rebel brigadiers. Daniel was severely wounded three times during the war. He was shot through the hip at the Battle of First Manassas, only to return to combat within the year. He carved a bullet out of his hand with a pocket knife in 1862 and nearly bled to death during the Battle of the Wilderness in 1864. Daniel became one of the most powerful Southern voices in the United States Senate, and he served there from 1887 to 1910. Daniel supported Winfield Scott Hancock for president in 1880 as the only hope of real reconciliation between the sections, and his public career, while often characterized as either rapidly partisan or rapidly racist, displayed a willingness to bury the hatchet and move forward as a unified federal republic. But Daniel never lost sight of Southern political principles or the role of the South, in particular, Virginia, played in the early history of the United States. After Daniel's death in 1910, one contemporary remarked, quote, I fancy that John Daniel would have named Thomas Jefferson as the greatest American statesman. Certainly his own political instincts and ideals were larger than those which Jefferson had caused to prevail. Like Jefferson, he trusted the people of his country because by close intimacy and wide experience, he had found them worthy of trust and believed them also worthy of freedom and political power. His abiding faith in the honesty of his fellow citizens, his rooted belief in their common sense, his trust in the appeal to the educated reason of the voters, his assurance that human society is capable of indefinite advancement in virtue and uprightness, his firm conviction that majority is ruled not by might alone, but, but of right as well, made of Thomas Jefferson the typical American and the like qualities made of John Daniel the typ typical Jeffersonian Democrat. And there was much truth in this assessment. Daniel was asked to speak about Jefferson Davis's life and character before the Virginia legislature in 1890, just one year after the former president's death. His purpose was to honor the man and his legacy and to vindicate the South and his struggle for independence. Daniel said, quote, Jefferson Davis never advocated an idea that did not have its foundation in the Declaration of Independence. That was not deductible from the Constitution of the United States as the fathers who made it interpreted its meaning. That had not been rung in his ears and stamped upon his heart from the hour when his father baptized him in the name of Jefferson and he saw First, and he first saw the light in a commonwealth that was yet vocal with the states' rights resolutions of 1798. Davis, Daniel insisted, should have been etched in stone among the great pantheon of world heroes. His cause was that of America. So again, bringing the South forward as part of America. Daniel then asked, did not the South love American institutions? What schoolboy cannot tell who wrote the Declaration? Now, of course, this is, this is 1890. I, you might get different answers today. So he's saying this in 1890. So if you said, what schoolboy cannot tell who wrote the Declaration? You might get some different answers. Who threw down the gauge, liberty or death? Who was chief framer of the Constitution? Who became its great expounder? Who wrote the Bill of Rights, which is copied far and wide by free commonwealths? Who presided over the convention that made the Constitution and became in field and council its all in all defender, Jefferson, Henry, Madison, Marshall, Mason, Washington, speak from your graves and give the answer. And Daniel emphasized that American history had been defined by the South, from the old Northwest Territory to Texas. Southerners had led the charge to settle North America, to bring America to the West. And by America, he meant the principles that define the South, liberty, independence, and free government. Their cause was that of the patriot who rode to battle against the British in 1776, both North and South. Now, modern critics would call this lost cause mythology. But Daniel displayed a cogency in his advocacy for the South in every possible venue. In fact, he was asked to give the concluding oration at, a dedic at the dedication of the Washington Monument in 1885. Now, who would ask someone like Daniel today to do that? The speakers of the day included the old icicle John Sherman, who was William T. Sherman's brother, and President Chester Arthur. And then they had Daniel. I don't know if he was kind of, well, just bring Daniel along so he can, but I think people really respected what he had to say, of course, Washington being the Virginian. Daniel did heap praise on the New England Patriot during the American War for Independence, but reminded the audience that Virginia had been first to resist the Stamp Act and the first to propose independence. He invoked the great names from Virginia history in an effort to place the Old Dominion 
at the forefront of the American experience. More importantly, Daniel emphasized that Washington was a Virginian before he was an American. This was no lost cause mythology. Southern historians in the postbellum period use it to take a dig at the notion that America had been formed by New Englanders. This was just another skirmish in the long cultural war between North and South that began, as Daniel illustrated in a speech, during the English Civil War of the 1640s. David Hackett Fisher's Albion Seed beautifully explains the cultural differences between North and South long before the slavery question was interjected into American politics. Daniel and other Southerners have been saying that for years. And of course, as part of our seminar readings, uh, Dr. Wilson talks about Fisher's book. Daniel is but one example of the dozens of Southerners who connected the Old South to the New, who sought to provide historical context for the actions of the Southern states in 1860 and 61. This may be a myth to those with a social or political agenda, but to the men who served and survived the war and lived in the defeated South, the myth was a powerful reality. Even Henry Grady, so conspicuously tied to the New South Creed, worked to hitch the Old South to the New. In one high-profile political campaign, Grady and his Atlanta Constitution supported John B. Gordon for governor in 1886 against August Octavius Bacon, a Macon lawyer, businessman, and statesman. Gordon, by this point, had a tarnished reputation as a political leader while in the United States Senate. Several letters indicating corruption were published in the press, and he was virtually broke in 1886. But the Southern people still held him in high regard for his military efforts during the war. Grady expertly used this to his advantage. When he invited both Jefferson Davis and Gordon to the Cornerstone Cemetery uh, ceremony, excuse me, for the Confederate Monument in Montgomery, Alabama, in 1886, 5,000 people attended that. 5,000 people came to a cornerstone ceremony. Not even the unveiling of the monument, just the cornerstone. And 100,000 people many of whom were former Confederate soldiers, flocked to catch a glimpse of Davis and Gordon when they traveled to Georgia. That's amazing. You wouldn't find, I mean, you'd hard to get 100 people today, but 100,000 people. This is when you say this, is, this was a lost cause myth. These people lived it. Loss in this history, of course, is A.O. Bacon, a future anti-imperialist, limited government center of the United States. Bacon also served in the Confederate Army, but he never had the public profile of Gordon. His political career was fairly free of scandal, and Bacon was the favorite to win the governorship until Grady interjected Gordon into the race. Bacon really personified the continuity between the Jeffersonian principles of the Old South and the application of those principles to the New. For example, he favored diversification of the Southern economy, but thought men like Grady had taken it too far. He went head-to-head -head with the administration of Teddy Roosevelt over the unconstitutional expansion of executive power and joined hands with a diverse group of statesmen and business leaders in opposing the Spanish-American War. To the end, Bacon favored the policies that formed the early Jeffersonian Republicans. He was recognized as the archetype of the Southern gentleman, the walking contrast of the new breed of Southern leaders like Pitchfork Ben Tillman of South Carolina and even Henry Grady. As these conservative voices began to die off in the early 20th century, they were replaced by the progressives. C. Van Woodward claims that Southern progressives were at one time Southern conservatives. And there is some truth to this statement. One thing that has often perplexed antebellum Southern historians is why these men uh, accepted a strong federal government. The Wilson administration ran roughshod over the Constitution, often with the complicit support of the Southern congressional delegation. The answer, I think, is to be found in their disdain for the northern elite. Take, for example, the great southern political leaders of the 1910s and 20s, men like Oscar Underwood, Henry Stegall, and Henry, and, uh, Henry D. Clayton of Alabama, Carter Glass of Virginia, and Arsene Pujo of Louisiana. All supported, at least to some extent, the progressive agenda of the Wilson administration. Underwood, for example, helped craft the Underwood Tariff, which included a revised income tax with a punitive top marginal rate. Clayton was famous or infamous for the Clayton Antitrust Act, and both Glass and Stegall had their names attached to the banking regulations known as Glass-Stegall, which were recently repealed by the Republican-controlled Congress. Pujo waged a one-man war against central banking and denounced the Federal Reserve as a dangerous institution. Put together, you can see the Jeffersonian Taylor resistance to northern finance capital but without the corollary of resistance to strong central government. 
These men had figured out that the apparatus the Republican Party put in place in the 19th century could be used against them. If they wanted big government, let them have it with, Southern, with a Southern brand of regulation. Northern finance capital and industrialists were the group harmed the most by these regulations, and they didn't care one lick about that. At the same time, Clayton made a strong push for agricultural loans, which eventually happened, punished the northern elite, and helped the small farmer. We can quibble with their methods, and even Underwood reversed course in his Drifting Sands of Party Politics, published in 1928 after he left Congress, but the intent was purely Jeffersonian. The same can be said for the group of Southerners that led the Congress during the mid-20th century. People like Richard B. Russell of Georgia, Sam Urban of North Carolina, Harry Byrd of Virginia, John Stennis of Mississippi, and even men like Huey Long of Louisiana. They often announced for their stand against civil rights, but all espoused a form of Jeffersonian political economy and Southern charm that made them irresistible to a broad spectrum of the American public. Irvin kept a published phone number so anyone could call him at home, even the loons, who would often keep him on the phone for hours at a time. Imagine that, a, a senator today keeping a published phone number so anybody can call. But he did that, and his wife would often get mad at him about it. Why are you on the phone with these people? The left has long wrestled over admiring his stand against Nixon and his opposition to no-knock laws while wondering how such a principal defender of civil liberties could oppose federal civil rights legislation. Long was instrumental in the careers of the Vanderbilt agrarians, when many taught at LSU, Robert Penn Warren's All, King's, All the King's Men would not have been possible without the Kingfish, and Long's Share of the Wealth program had a recognizable Jeffersonian influence in its attack on big banks and government uh, supported finance capital, even if its methods shaded towards socialism. There's a wonderful little book published in 1979 entitled uh, The Natural Superiority of Southern Politicians. It was written by David Chandler, and he outlines why Southerners have been able to control the halls of Congress because they were just better. <laughs> but all of these 20th century figures need our attention. Well, what can we learn from them, and can we separate their views on race, which are not palatable to the 21st century politico, from their views on government and finance? I think the answer is definitively yes, but more work needs to be done in this area. Now, the Southern attitude towards organized finance leads to another question. How did the Old South affect the economic life of the new? Certain Southern attitudes towards labor and work permeated the industrializing South. Most historians have focused on the system of sharecropping and crop lean, and rightly so, for it impacted a large swath of the Southern people, both black and white. Most Southerners were still farmers well into the 20th century, so labor patterns in Southern communities were still tied to the land. But lost in much of this work are free black, black property owners and the impact of economic diversification on both the white and black community. It used to be that Reconstruction was portrayed as a stain on American history, a time when Northern policies were unduly harsh towards white Southerners, particularly in regard to economic activity. Philip Lee's recent Southern Reconstruction, just published in 2017, has concisely shown the effects of Northern policies on the Southern people. But more work needs to be done here. As an aside, and I'll talk about literature in a few minutes, the now popular Southern novelist Ron Rash does a very good job with the New South through literature. His One Foot in Eden and Serena depict Southerners wrestling with modernity and the changing nature of Southern society. Now the South, of course, undertook under industrialization slowly and did so in their own way. While many Southern factories adopted Northern labor methods and hired women and children to do much of the work, by the early 20th century, such patterns have been modified to adopt a more humane approach to labor. This was born in paternalism of Southern, uh, in the paternalism of Southern labor relations before the war. That term paternalism is now considered a trigger word, a trigger warning, right? But there was a time when studies of antebellum Southern labor discussed whether the South was paternalistic or ultra-capitalist. And I, and I point to uh, Time on the Cross, Vogel Engerman's Time on the Cross, and he actually brings this up. He says the South was actually both, and I agree. The South was a bit of both. Southerners made money, but even as the establishment historian Julie Saville notes in her The Work of Reconstruction, slave labor models were often determined by the circumstances of the plantation and not by some northern conception of wage labor and the nature of work. There was a rhythm to southern plantation work that carried over into the New South and into the factories. For example, a 1950s documentary on the Avondale Mills in Sylacauga, Alabama – 
highlights the paternalistic system so common in southern factories at the time. Workers were given homes, gardens, schools, public amenities like swimming pools, and a stake in the town. To be sure, this took time to develop. The founder and scion of the Avondale Project, Braxton Bragg Comer, staunchly opposed uh, child labor restrictions in the early 20th century. But by the 1920s, much of that was dropped in favor of paternalism. The Calloway family in LaGrange, Georgia, practiced the same type of system in their cotton mills even, into, even in the late 19th century, so long before the middle of the 20th century. Fuller Calloway remarked that he wanted to organize the mill on, quote, human lines. His model was simple. If you are working with cows, you have to think like cows. If you're working with men, you have to think like them. And you must never expect them to do anything that isn't human. Calloway called the poor people of LaGrange the finest people on earth and later gloated, quote, I make American citizens and run cotton mills to pay the expenses. American citizens. And there are countless stories across the South of this type of economic model. And even today, the South is home to dozens of companies that regularly appear in the Forbes Top 100 for employee relations and benefits. Tesis and Aflac are routinely ranked highly for employee relations, both are headquartered in Columbus, Georgia. Tesis was actually founded by a man named W.C. Bradley and boasts a servant leadership model that is the envy of many other companies. This includes family counseling benefits based on a religious model, Christian model. Before Google became the standard by which other companies had, are measured in regard to benefits, there were southern companies that took pride in labor relations. The stories behind these companies need our attention. For so often, the Marxists and carpetbaggers take hold of the narrative and focus on the supposed misdeeds and ill-gotten gains of these men and not the value that they place, to their com they place in their communities. No one can forget the Callaways in Pine Mountain, Georgia. The Callaway family turned to philanthropy after selling their stock in their mills and formed a beautiful private nature reserve and began donating to several causes designed to help the people of West Georgia, including investing heavily in LaGrange College. If you've never been to Callaway Gardens, it is a wonderful place in Pine Mountain. And it's all private. And it's amazing. You walk in the door, they have this video showing, and uh, they attack the conservation ethic, uh, which Gifford Pinchot of Connecticut made so famous by saying, you know, the only thing that conserves land is government. Individuals waste it. And so they have this attack on it right as you walk in the door. No, no, no. See, we have a private reserve here, and it's nice, and it's beautiful. Uh, they're, they're, uh, several times a year they do just wonderful functions. Um, if, you, if you love azaleas, they have uh, just beautiful azalea gardens uh, in the spring. And every, people come from all over the southeast to see it. And it's all private. And it's all from these rascally southerners. Finally, Southern literature perhaps and has, has and, ha and, and will continue to have the greatest impact on how Americans view both the Old and New South. Southerners were certainly conscious of this in the postbellum period. Again, Mencken slapped that the South of the Sahara of the Beaux-Arts does not quite work. The agrarians famously took him to task for this claim, and the salutary effect of such a flippant statement helped elevate Faulkner, O'Connor, and others to higher claim. College students will read Faulkner and O'Connor, if nothing else, from the South. That, of course, is a good place to start. But by default, it accepts Mencken's umbrella condemnation of Southern literature in the period to 1930. Over a decade before Mencken said that about the South and its intellectual worth, several Southern writers and academics produced a multi-volume study of Southern literature titled The Library of Southern Literature. These type of collections were popular in the late 19th and early 20th century. They were part encyclopedia, part history, and part literature. And of course, you can get them for free online now. This, this whole collection is out there. The editors would select both the best writers and their best works, write nice little introductions to the content, and then allow the reader to sample why the author was included in the anthology. But the editors of this collection knew something else was at stake. Like the multi-volume Southern history I'll discuss in my next talk, the aim of this particular collection was the, was the rehabilitation and reunification of placing the South within the American nation. The editors were consciously Southern and hoped that their efforts would enrich the American experience by providing tales of home, which is vital, again, as Flannery O'Connor pointed out in the readings, it's vital for literature. Now, the editor of the series was a man named Edward Alderman. And Alderman wrote this, quote, The South has been called a sincere and distinctive section of the republic. 
It is all that and more. Of all our well-defined sections, it seems to be the richest in romanticism and idealism and tragedy and suffering and in pride of region and love of home. English civilization began on its water courses, and for nearly 300 years it has lived under an ordered government. It is difficult to imagine how the nation could have been fostered in maturity without the influences that came from the South. Under the play of great historic forces, this region developed so strong a sense of unity within itself as to issue in a claim of separate nationality, which it was, which it was willing to defend in a great war. No other section of our country has ever known in its fullest sense so complete a discipline of war and defeat, nor has any group of men or states ever mastered new conditions and reconquered peace and prosperity with more dignity and self-reliance. Here then would seem to be all the elements for making a great literature, experience of triumph and suffering, achievement and defeat. Now, Alderman was born in North Carolina in 1861. He was serving as the president of the University of Virginia at this point. He had also been the president of the University of North Carolina and Tulane. Now, could anyone today imagine the current president of UVA, Teresa Sull Sullivan, writing this? Simply uttering the word Southern in a public UVA setting would force her to issue a lengthy apology for using such offensive language. <laughs> but this is beautiful, what he says, and this is why you had this this anthology of Southern literature. The aging Joel Chandler Harris served as one of the editors-in-chief of the series. Harris, of course, gained fame both as a journalist for Henry Grady's Atlanta Constitution and as the author of Uncle Remus, stories that delighted children across the United States. Harris, in fact, was one of the most popular literary figures of the post-bellum period, but he and his stories have been largely forgotten today in part because they use quote, ethnic language. The same thing Faulkner used in many of his works, but Harris was viewed as a conservative and Faulkner a liberal, making Harris a fugitive and Faulkner a hero. Of course, this is a misreading of Faulkner, but regardless, Harris has been cast aside as an archaic reminder of a South that needs to be buried. This is both unfortunate and historically inaccurate. But what can we expect from a politically correct world? No one from a northern institution graced the list of contributors and editors for the Library of Southern uh, Literature. Not one northerner. All southerners. The same thing with the history series that I'll talk about in, the ne in my next talk. Charles Kent, who was a professor of English at UVA and editor of several good collections of southern poetry, and C. Alfonso Smith, founder of the Virginia Folklore Society, first Edgar Allan Poe professor of English at UVA, and author of a fine biography of O. Henry, served as associate editors. The list of advisors and executive board members for the series was a who's who in Southern intellectual, educational, political life at the time. The most important classicist of the era, Basil Gildersleeve, lent his name to the project, as did General Stephen D. Lee. No less than 15 presidents or chancellors of Southern universities were part of the editorial board, and several current or ex-governors, judges, congressmen, and ecclesiastical leaders participated as well. No current Southern literary project can match the esteemed and pro-Southern members of this group. The collection not only included men and women of letters, but those who had made, an or made oratory or political impact on the South as well. For example, volume six includes speeches by John B. Gordon, Wade Hampton, William Henry Harrison, and Robert Hayne, along with works by Harris and William Hamilton Hayne, among others. Every other book in the 16-volume collection followed the same pattern. By showing that the South was more than just a backwater region with little artistic merit, these Southerners placed their section at the heart of the American experience and would not be a stretch to conjoin the literary theme with that of Southern music, perhaps the most enduring aspect of Southern cultural and arts. No form of American music was born outside of the South, and like music, as Alderman emphasized, to be both good and interesting, literature has to have an attachment to home, to a place, and a people, and those people need a story to tell. No section, has a better, no section of America has a better story than the South. In a book entitled Ghosts of the Confederacy, LSU history professor Gaines Foster is highly critical of both the motives and the content of the Library of Southern Literature. He views it as little more than an artful propaganda piece designed to curry favor with the wave of lost cause mythology that saturated the South in the postbellum period and to place the South in a better position vis-a-vis -vis the North. 
noting that several of the authors held private views that contradicted their public statements in regard to the war and Southern identity, and often called to free history from the stifling sentimentality of the veterans, Foster cannot understand why these professional academics, quote, did little to distance themselves from the commonly accepted interpretations of Confederate history. This statement says more about Foster than it does about the Southern academics of the early postbellum period. Foster is admitting he thinks Southerners made a conscious decision to lie about their past in order to forge a lost cause myth tied into a New South creed. This is why this period of Southern history is critical to our current situation. People like Foster control the narrative. It has not always been so. Perhaps these academics bought the history, quote-unquote, bought the history of their period because it was largely true. No current establishment academic has dared make that claim. It would be career suicide. But if the academy was seriously dedicated to real scholarship, it would both embrace Genovese's call to understand Southerners and Southern society without haphazardly condemning it, and Richard Weaver's insistence <laughs> that the South has much to teach about modern, much to teach modern America. But as Clyde Wilson has noted, this would place the burden of the myth of the war on the North, not the South, and would take the fire out of the current crusade against Southern symbols. To the political and academic left, that can never be allowed to happen. Thank you for your time.